Peace and love, black family. Peace, peace, peace and love. This is the Prince of Pan-Africanism, King Kong Consciousness, International Ifa Tunde, Notorious RBG. We are live for Black Parent Teleconference, first one we've done in the 2020 calendar year. 2320158. This teleconference is only about children. So if you have a question, you can call 857-232-0158-857-232-0158-857-232-0158-857-232-0158-857-232-0158-857-232-0158-857-232-0158-857-232-0158-857-232-0158-857-232-0158-857-232-0158-857-232-0158-857-232-0158-857-232-0158-857-
knowledge of new words. And what we want to do for children who are in the preschool age range, as is your daughter, is we want to maximize that vocabulary expansion. There is a philosophical construct known as the language acquisition device, LAD. In psychology and education, we call it a philosophical language device because we can't prove that it exists. But philosophically, this language acquisition device is wide open and it is very efficient between the age of two and five. So what you wanna be doing is you wanna be reading with her you want to be teaching her her alphabet if you don't already know it, okay? You want to begin to introduce her sight words, and you want to introduce to her the sounds associated with the letters so she can begin to pronounce those sight words. There's no reason why a five-year-old should not show up in kindergarten already equipped with the ability to read. Uh, your daughter can have that and she can learn it in one year. So let's just say hypothetically for parents who are listening who may be a little bit behind, they can catch up real quick. So your daughter is in that in that language acquisition device expansion period of life. And we want to take advantage of it. The problem that I have with us African American Africans is we don't take advantage of that time. When you think of the average African-American child from two to five, maybe not your child, but a lot of our children, what are they doing? Playing, learning music, dancing, watching cartoons, uh, music on the iPad, surfing the Internet, watching mm -hmm. movies. I mean, if most of the time for two to five year olds, we give them busy work, stuff that will keep them busy so their parents are freed up to take care of some other things. And it's just unfortunate that during one of the greatest opportunities to expand our children's vocabulary and language skills in many black households, we're not maximizing that. We're simply putting them in front of gadgets and phones and televisions, and we're missing out on a very, very important period in the development of the child. And the last thing I'm gonna say, and I'll take your other question, the other thing I wanna okay. say is this helps explain why American African children have the working vocabulary that is usually about three grades beneath their class standing or age. So in America, many of our eighth grade children have the working vocabulary of fifth graders. And many of our fifth grade children have the working vocabulary of second graders. And many of our second grade children have the working vocabulary of preschoolers. Our high school students often have the working vocabulary of middle school students. And guess where the foundation was laid? Between two and five. So that period where we should have been taking advantage of the brains uh, interest in expanding its knowledge of vocabulary by thousands of words. That time when we should have been taking advantage of that, we were not. We were not. And we and, and guess what? We tend not to catch up over time. Because if you think about it, especially now in the age of social networking, once a child gets that cell phone, and many parents are so quick to put a cell phone in the hands of their child, smartphone rather because i don't have a problem with a cell phone in case you need to call your kid kid needs to call you but the smartphone many of us can't wait to put a smartphone in the hands of our children and once they get that smartphone are they going to read anymore probably not which is why i call the cell phone and the ipad and the video game those are those are what i call pro incarceration activities the cell phone for a black boy is a pro-incarceration activity. The cell phone for a black girl is a pro-poverty activity because the more time they spend on that cell phone and on that iPad, the less time they're spending reading. And we know that there's a clear relationship between reading skill and future incarceration for boys 
and poverty for girls. So I just really hope, especially now, since most of our children are home because of COVID restrictions, it is my sincere hope that parents are making their children read. You can get books from the library. We got public libraries in every city. Yes, a lot of them are being closed because we don't use them. This is a time for reading, not video gaming, not social networking, but it is a time for reading. So every parent out there, your child should be reading at least, minimally, at least one book a month. And that's low. Honestly, they should be getting through a book a week. High school down to preschool, they should be getting through a book a week. And for preschool kids who have not yet learned how to read, we should be reading a book a week with them. We have to show them that reading is fun. We have to show them that reading is important and then they will see it as fun and important. But if we only treat it as a burden, if children only read when they have schoolwork, if they only read when they have homework, then guess what? They're not gonna treat reading as a leisurely activity. Most of our kids only treat reading as a scholastic activity because the only time they read is when they have to for school. We have to change that culture and make reading a part of the family's culture and make reading a leisurely activity. Because for me, it has been a leisurely activity for me since as long as I can remember, I've loved reading. Um, and I don't think it's any small coincidence that I am where I am because I like to read. But go ahead, my brother, with your second question. Well, my second question, uh, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, for that knowledge uh, to begin with. Uh, my second question is almost kind of pivoted off what you just said. Um, my daughter also has like a slight uh, speech impediment where yes. basically her, her uh, C's sound like T's and... Uh, things of that nature. So just basically, for example, uh, cake would be take, you know, something to that to effect. And um, I was trying to see how do I approach it, you know, as like I say, starting school to where, you know, in these years, you know, everything is built, you know, uh, for a child's, uh, you know, confidence, self-esteem, uh, things of that nature, but very vital things uh, in a uh, developing mind's uh, future. Um, how would one go approach that? Um, like I said, she's highly, highly intelligent, highly, highly active, uh, 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 impeccable memory. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I would say her, her front the cortex and everything, her front the low, everything is developing at a, a, a superior weight, superior rate. Um, just like they pronounce in some words, uh, you know, or just basically just second nature to her. Um, and how would, how would I go about approaching that without, you know, well, delicately, delicately approaching such um, in, this, in this crucial time for her, just like I say, in the early years of about to start school, uh, start school and everything like that. Um, uh, and, and as far as reading goes, uh, I try, try my best to, uh, you know, read with her as much as possible. Uh, I'm guilty of myself, you know, reading out of necessity as far as uh, pleasure. Um, uh, as far as, uh, you know, you know, based off my profession, you know, uh, just going ahead and reading, you know, several several books of uh, literature, you know, it's just not, just hasn't been my forte. However, if it's a necessity for it, not necessarily scholastic, I will go ahead and digest as much of the, as much of the literature as I possibly can and, and be able to regurgitate it uh, if needed. Uh, okay. It's just the way I learned, uh, you know, and was in, you know, top 10%, top 20% graduating. It just worked for me. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to see how I would instill such, you know, good habits. But we want to tackling, uh, like I say, the slight, the slight speech and, you know, developing, you know, good habits. Um, into my daughter. Okay, let me uh, ask that question. And thanks for that call, my brother. Thanks for that call. I'm gonna answer that and move on to the next caller. Um, okay. Let me deal with this issue of speech. So the question revolved around potential speech delay. Couple of ideas. Number one, if it's, a, if it's what you consider to be a mild issue, and this is for all parents because this was a good question. If you consider it to be a mild issue, 
then what I would do is I would practice having my child, okay, imitate and model my own speech. So if there's a issue of them convoluting one sound of a letter for the sound of another letter, I would make them look at my mouth as I pronounce the letter, the sound, the word. And then I would have them model that. Sometimes children just need to see how the lips are, how the tongue is, okay? How the mouth uh, moves when it produces a particular sound. So these are just regular exercises you can do with your child by making them watch you as you slowly articulate that particular word, sound, or letter. That's number one. Number two, your child is in preschool or at least preschool age. So federal special ed law goes into effect at the age of three. So what I'm saying is if you wanted to, if you wanted to, any parent in America with a child who is at least three years old who suspects that there might be a speech problem or any other problem, okay, could get in contact with the local school board, special education office or early intervention office and request an early intervention evaluated evaluation for your child who is at least three, but who has not yet began kindergarten. So if they are at least three and has not yet begun kindergarten, so they could be as old as five, six, in some cases seven, if they have not begun kindergarten, it is called an early intervention evaluation. And you tell them, my child has some speech limitations and I would like for them to get evaluated to determine if they qualify for speech therapy. So they will either call you in or send one, someone to the home or send you to a provider office and you will sign a permission to evaluate form, giving them permission to evaluate your child and determine whether or not. I need everybody to mute their phones on the call, please. Please mute your phones on the call. And they will provide you with a permission to evaluate form. You will sign that. And then the speech pathologist, the speech pathologist for the school district or for the agency that the school district contracts with will evaluate your child and determine if they qualify for speech and language service. That determination will be made usually on a 25 to 40 percent delay. In other words, if your child has a speech delay, but they are not delayed at least 25 percent compared with other regular children their age, if their delay is at, is is not at least 25%, they may not qualify. So let's say your daughter gets evaluated for speech and she does have a delay, but it's only 15%. She can be refused service on the grounds that it's not 25%. And the reason school districts, and it's normally between 25 to 50, some 25 to 40, some school districts could be a little higher. Some could be a little lower. And the reason they do this is because they don't have enough speech pathologists to service every child. So the way they try to keep the case load manageable is by requiring that the child have a delay that is at least 25 percent or greater. So if the child ends up with a delay that's less than 25 to 40 percent, then you would have to contact a private speech therapist and pay out of pocket for speech therapy. And just to let everybody know, the African American Speech and Language Pathologist Organization is actually based in Pennsylvania. I think it's Pittsburgh. It may not be Pittsburgh. You can Google it online. But the African American Speech and Language Therapist Association, or they might call it the African American Speech and Language Pathologist Association is based in Pennsylvania. You can call them up, email them through their website, and you can get a referral for a speech therapist in your area if you're going to pay out of pocket. I would also say if it were me, I would probably pay out of pocket anyway. 
if I could afford it, because the quality of speech service that our children get in America's public and charter schools is pretty poor, in my opinion. Uh, in my opinion, speech and language therapists, and I'm not throwing them under the bus because I know some very good ones, but in my opinion, speech and language therapists are some of the most... They like to get over. And I'm not saying they do this as a profession, but in that profession, it's easy to evade accountability for your work because it's kind of difficult to prove if you really worked with that child and did a good enough job. And that's why in the black community, we often see children who have been receiving speech therapy for years, receiving speech therapy for years, whose speech impediment doesn't improve, whose articulation doesn't improve, whose receptive language skill doesn't improve because if you're a speech therapist and you're in that office with that child by yourself, there's no way to prove if you if you are mute your phone, please. Mute your phone. You're yelling all on my calls. Excuse me. Mute your phone. Oh man, they doing this on purpose. Okay, let me see if I can mute everybody. That ain't it. Okay, I think they. Okay, can y'all still hear me on the call? Somebody. Okay. Nah, it's okay. We were, that's the haters. That's the haters disrupting the call. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. No, one second. I got you. That's the haters. That's the haters. So this is what we're going to have to do, family, on the call. Unfortunately, we have some serious coonism going on. I was hoping they would respect parents who are trying to help their children enough to not disrupt the call. But I have some people, some jealous uh, men and women. I don't want to call them brothers and sisters, but we have some jealous, envious, dysfunctional mad at their life Negroes out there who don't hold anything sacred and they would disrupt a call to help black parents uh, to help. Um, my first is going to be 14 this year. My middle is going to be turning 11 and then my youngest is 9. And my experience over the years of being a, a mom has been that there's always been an issue with my children because they do so well so at the moment now because it's been just to cut a long story short there have been so many exclusions and isolation for my youngest child that i've had to battle through with you know having to write to the minister of education having to write to Ofsted, and having to kind of you know um see reasons with the head teachers to the best way to treat my children because what they've always attacked me with was my children have behavioral problems now, when I try to dissect and get to the bottom of where they came about this whole behavioral issue, no one seems to give me a concrete solution. So at the moment, I'm able to kind of, you know, threaten legal actions and what to do. So at, it's at bay. But I fear that when my middle son, who will be going to secondary school, goes away, they will start the attack again on my youngest. So I, I don't know what to do. Because I keep, I mean, I don't even know, you know, the whole systematic, you know, um, uh, fight against our black children and i'm still keep going through your um your clips on youtube and trying to learn and understand how these things work and it is really astonishing but i do know that once the school system goes back come september when my middle son will be going to secondary school to join his older brother leaving my youngest at school i feel that this will resurrect again and it gets a bit tiring having to fight it's because I'm going to keep fighting for my children. You know, they do exceedingly well at school. The, the, the top, you know, five students. My son has been excluded for nearly almost a whole uh, semester, well, not semester, a whole term, we call it here. And he's able to kind of meet up because I've been doing my training at home. So to keep going on, this is a question. But I just need to know, because I've had to sit down with a new head, we've got a new head teacher that has come into play now. And 
he's kind of tried to attack me and I've given him a, a history of what I've been battling with and so far no one seems to give me any evidence that my children have any issues. But when I when I then demonstrate how good they are at school at home with their academic you know, um, activities at home in comparison to the school, you know, it just proves insignificant. And so he made a comment that stating that there needs to be a stop to all this. You can see, I could show him records starting from my son who is now 14. When he was five, they started this whole issue of behavioral problem simply because he wanted to play the role of um, king, uh, one of the king of Egypt, and they were trying to kind of push a, 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 a white child you know, in front of this role, and that became an issue. And there's been some occasions where my son would correct his teacher for teaching, you know, teaching the wrong things or the wrong terms. So that's been an issue. And I think they've kind of picked on him on that. And I've kind of tried to do these things with, you know, so many government bodies. I don't have any government body here that fights specifically for me as a black woman with three children. I've had to use my academic background to kind of know how to challenge them, you know, without to show emotions or just challenging them. Um, the accusations because you have to have concrete evidence and so far to this every day no one has given me any but they keep coming back you know with different things i've had to change schools unfortunately i live in a predominantly um white environment uh, but I, I i it doesn't really affect me so much because i just know who i am and i don't need to kind of conform to their lifestyle or what to do but they just kind of every time i challenge them they always seem to ask what my background is what's my level of education and i don't know what bearing that has got to do with the accusation so what do i do okay to defend myself because i need to come again okay great 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 question and i'm sorry you're having this issue this is a pretty big issue overall so this is about behavior complaints from the school, mostly white folk complaining about a young African child. Okay, couple things here, couple things. Number one, one of the things that you're going to have to fight to get the school and the teacher to understand and these are psychological facts, by the way. And they are that all behavior is a function of the context and the consequences. Dr. Omar, you're breaking up. I can't hear you. Yes, that's that's someone uh, trolling on the call. Let's 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 uh, hold on one second, Queen. We are in trouble as black people. We are in trouble. Um, okay, so all behavior is a function of the consequences and the context where it happens. You're going to have to get the teacher in the school to understand that. In other words, constantly calling you up if there's a behavior problem is not a solution because you're not in charge of the context. The context is the classroom, the setting, the setting where behavior happens influences the behavior. So the teacher has to take responsibility for the setting and the triggers in that setting and the variables in that setting that influence your child's behavior. You cannot expect a parent to control a child's behavior in a setting I'm going to do another phone number. I'm going to hang up and I'm going to do another phone number, family, in one minute. I had to hang up the call because somebody got on and started playing YouTube clips. So I'm going to put another number out there. And I'm so sorry because that sister was calling long distance. She was on a long distance call from the United Kingdom and we had to stop the call. Brothers and sisters... This is why I always say we have more coons 
then we have conscious people. This is a phone call to help our parents. This is a phone call to help black parents. I'm the only one in the country that does this. I'm the only one in the country that does this. Free expert advice from a school psychologist, doctor of clinical psychology. Nobody else is doing this for free. Nobody else is doing this for free. And instead of helping our parents, respecting the space, they want to use it as an opportunity to coon. It's such a shame. But um, I'm going to put another number in the call. I'm going to put another number in the call. Sad. Sad, sad, sad. Um, oh, man. That is sad. That is a damn shame. She was long distance. I apologize to you, sister. I'm hoping you're watching me because I'm going to answer your question right after I put um, the new call in number. And I know how to mute everyone on a new call in, on a new call in number. That's a damn shame. Can't even have a call for parents. Now, I don't want Zoom because everybody can't necessarily fit on Zoom. Uh, but I may have to go to a Zoom format. Okay. 602. Uh, whew. Okay, this is going to be the new call-in number. I need somebody to put it in the chat. This is going to be the new call-in number. And my sister from the UK, I'm going to answer your question in one minute. Okay, so I'm hoping you're watching. This is the new call-in number. And it is 602-580-5444. Please put this in the chat. Please put this in the chat. 602-580-9231. And the access code is 397-5228. 397-5228. Three nine seven fifty two twenty eight. Thank you, Brother Willie Jones. Brother Will, if you can, go to Instagram and do the same thing, please. Go to Instagram and post the number with the code as well so they'll have it. I know how to meet folks on the other one. It's a shame we even got to be bothered with that. But that just shows you how sick our people are. We are a sick bunch of people. And the people who do that, I can almost promise you that they come to my lectures and get pictures and books signed. Almost promise you. We're not even honest with our jealousy. We will sabotage and show right up at a Dr. Umar event smiling for a picture and a book sign. If you're in the United Kingdom, the number is plus four four three three zero zero eight eight one five one four. Okay, if you're in the United Kingdom, the number is plus four four three three zero zero eight eight one five one four for the UK. So I'm going to call into that number now. I got to remember my code, though. Wow. Welcome and thank you for choosing freeconferencecall.com. You're helping people around the world communicate for free. 
Please enter your access code followed by the pound or hash sign. If you are the host, press star now. Otherwise, please wait. Please enter your PIN followed by the pound or hash. If you do... Thank you. There are six participants in the conference. Please announce yourself. Okay. All right. Uh, you cannot be on the speakerphone. Come on, people. Let's get serious now. Take, take, take the call off the speaker. Okay. All participants are muted right now. You can unmute yourself after I answer this behavior question. Okay. Behavior. Number one, as I was telling the sister, all behavior is a function of context and consequences. Where it happens and what the teacher does in response to it. Parents can and should support teachers. Parents can influence child behavior at school. After all, they are your child and you're able to use consequences that teachers do not have at their exposal. But it is important that you educate the school and the teacher to make sure they understand that behavior is a function of where it happens. You have to tell the teacher this. Behavior is a function of where it happens. This is your classroom. This is your classroom. This is your classroom. What are you doing to improve behavior in your class? Okay, so context. Where does the child sit in the class? Who is the child sitting around? What does the teacher do when the child miss? behaves. All of this is important. All of this is important. And then the consequences. What do you do when the child is not on task? What do you do when the child is off task? It is not the parent's job to control behavior in a teacher's classroom. And you all have to be very, very adamant about making sure the school knows that you know it is not your job to control behavior in their classroom. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Some of us have some very disorderly, disrespectful children. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Some of us... Hello? Okay. Some of us have some very disorderly, disrespectful disorganized children okay can y'all hear me on the line i believe y'all can right those of you who are calling in even though i muted the lines can y'all hear me can somebody tell me if you can hear me please on the phone all participants are muted can y'all hear me on the phone I'm a, mm, a, let me see something. Let me text somebody. Dallas. Uh, I want to make sure they can hear me on the call. Can somebody text me or let me know if y'all can hear me on the call? I'm assuming y'all can't because no one has responded. Those of you who are on the phone, can you hear me? All participants are unmuted. Yes, I can hear you. You can hear me now. Did you hear me when it was muted? Yes. You did. Okay, so I'm going to mute y'all back again. I just wanted to make sure y'all could hear me when it was muted. Okay. Okay, so, so, make sure the school is clear that you are aware that 
All behavior is a function of where it happens and what happens as a result. Now, with that being said, you should then ask for the teacher's classroom management program. Ask to see it. What is the classroom behavior management program? In other words, when a child misbehaves, what happens? When a child appropriately behaves, what happens? As a parent, you have a right to know whether or not the teacher is doing anything to deal with your child's behavior. And too often, the problem is we don't make the teacher accountable for what happens in the class. They make the parent the scapegoat for the whole behavioral situation. They make the parents a scapegoat for the entire behavioral uh, uh, situation, brothers and sisters. Don't let them do that. Yes, you are responsible, but so are the teachers. Make sure they understand that. This is your class. This is your classroom. What are you doing to improve behavior in your classroom? Now, here's what I recommend. If my child was constantly being picked on by teachers, constantly being identified as a behavior problem, you know what I'm going to do? And this is what I recommend that all of you do, including our family in the United Kingdom. Okay? Hire a private psychologist or behavior specialist. Hire a private psychologist or behavior specialist. Have them go into your child's school and observe your child in the classroom and let the school know that I have personally acquired the services of a school psychologist or any psychologist. They're going to come into the child's class. They're going to observe my son, observe my daughter, observe my grandchild. And then we're going to have a meeting after they conduct their observations to determine how you all can, how we can work together to improve my child's behavior. That's how you cut this situation down because you cannot assume the teacher is telling you the truth. Let me say that again. You cannot assume that the teacher is telling you the truth. Let me say that one more time. You cannot assume that the teacher is telling you the truth. Teachers lie. And if they don't like your child, they will really lie in order to get that child put out the class, put out the school, put on medicine, thrown in special education. So the only way you can prove if the teacher is lying or telling the truth is to hire somebody outside the school and hire that person, okay, to uh, go into the class and observe your child. Now, they should observe your child three times, minimally three times, three times, three one-hour observations. Week number one, nine o'clock in the morning during math class. Week number two, 11 o'clock in the morning, language arts. Week number three, two o'clock in the afternoon, social studies. You see that? Three different observations, three different weeks, three different times, three different subjects. And the reason you want to do that is because if you only get one observation and your child was really, really bad that day, then that observation can misrepresent how your child really acts. If you only get one observation and your child was really, really well behaved that day, then that one observation can be an aberration. That's not a good sample of behavior. So I'm saying you need to get three samples. I'm saying you need to get three samples of behavior. Three. If you have three samples and that child is pretty much acting the same way after three samples, we can pretty much put confidence in those samples that they are an accurate representation of your child's behavior. So get at least three samples. You can get four observations. You can get five. You can get six. But I'm trying to be sensitive 
to your pocketbook. I'm trying to be sensitive to your pocketbook here. Well, on Instagram, I don't know how to turn off the comments during a live. If you know how I can do that, then I will definitely turn the comments off on Instagram. I don't know how to do that during a live. But anyway, okay, but just stay focused because I'm focused. Don't mind the coons. The coons are actually our fault because we have not been raising black children to be respectful. We have not been raising them to respect their community. We have not been raising them to respect children, to respect family. So this is our fault. This is our fault. If I was a white psychologist doing this for white people, we would not have none of this. If I was a Latino psychologist doing this for Latino parents, we wouldn't be having this problem. If I was a Chinese psychologist giving free service to Chinese parents to help their children, we would not have this. The only reason we have this is because I'm black. The only reason this is happening is because I'm black. And because we as black people don't respect one another. That's the only reason why. Other people watching this, they're probably shaking their head. This man is giving out thousands of dollars of free information and people of his own community are trying to sabotage his attempt to help their own parents. Okay? So this is post-traumatic slavery disease. This is. So, hire someone to go into the classroom. Hire someone to go into the classroom and observe your child. Because if that psychologist goes into the classroom to observe your child and they don't find any problems or they might find that the, your child is misbehaving but so are all of the other children. What if your child is in the classroom where all of the children misbehave? See, if all the children are misbehaving or if half the children are misbehaving or if most of the children are misbehaving, then this is not about your child. This is about the classroom. You cannot expect one child to behave when the rest of them are misbehaving. You cannot expect one child to misbehave when the rest of them are misbehaving, brothers and sisters. So that is my recommendation. And if your child is in special ed, if your child is a special ed student, the IEP team, the IEP team must conduct a functional behavioral assessment and a positive behavior plan. The IEP team must conduct a functional behavioral assessment and they must create a positive behavior plan to address the special ed child's needs. If they do not have a functional behavioral assessment and positive behavior plan attached to the IEP, then you could argue that that IEP is invalid, it is not appropriate, and you could force the school to pay for your child to go to a private school where they will get the type of behavioral management skills that they require. Special ed children have more rights than regular children. Special ed children have more rights than regular children. So if you have a special ed child, you can really make the teacher be accountable. You can really make the principal be accountable because special ed law says that you must, special ed law says that you must meet the needs, behavioral needs of special ed kids. Let me go. All participants are unmuted. Okay, let me go to the back to the lines. If you have a question, go ahead and shout your city out for me, please. Minneapolis, Minnesota. Big woo, big woo, big woo. Let me get a woo in the chat. Let me get a big woo in the chat. Woo, woo. So can I ask my question? One second, my brother. Go right ahead with the question. Okay, I got a 13-year-old son, and I'm having an issue with the school. And the issue that I'm having with the school is they're not helping me. And when I say they're not helping me, I'm not able to get any kind of services for him. Being that we don't live in um, a low-performance school district, 
they're not wanting to identify him for any type of services. And so the problem that we're having is emotionally having issues versus and what is going on is it's affecting him with the school, his concentration, not being able to stay focused. And so the issue that he's having is we lost his sister three years ago. And so he really hasn't come back from that. And so that's just all around affecting him at school. He's been something that's been brought up with the school meeting after meeting and now it's what kind of service are you in search of, my brother? What kind of service? 